Today is the second week in our sermon series, The Attributes of God. And attributes are character qualities, inherent qualities to someone. So here are some inherent qualities to God. He is supreme. He is eternal. He is righteous. We want to know who God is in this series according to who he says he is. We don't want to just hear what the world has to say about God. We want to go into scripture and find out what God says. So this is what John wrote. Would you say the yellow part with me? God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. So what exactly does this mean? And how does it apply to our lives today? To answer that question, we must first answer what is love? If you ask people today, you'll get a lot of different answers. A few years ago, there was a contest to come up with the best answer to what is love. And the contestants had to be children 10 years old and younger. Now listen to the finalists. Carl, age five, he said, love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne that go out and smell each other. So that's one idea of love, right? We would say that's true. Carl has in mind the affectionate and romantic love between a man and a woman. Billy, age four, said, when someone loves you, the way they say your name is different. You just know that your name is safe in their mouths, right? The way they say your name is different. And you can tell the difference. When someone loves you, your name is safe with them. But the winner of the contest was a four-year-old boy whose next-door neighbor was an elderly man who had just lost his wife. When the child saw the man cry, the little boy went over into the man's yard and climbed on top of the man's lap and just sat there. When the boy's mother asked him what he had said to his neighbor, the little boy said, Nothing. I just helped him cry. Wow. I think we would all agree that that's love. Listening. Giving time being present without expecting anything in return? Those are all good answers. What would be your answer? I looked up the definition of love. It's an intense feeling of deep affection. So how would you answer the question, what is love? If I had to give one word to help explain love, sacrifice. I looked up the definition to give up something important or valued for the sake of others. Jesus gave up his life for the sake of others. Jesus made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross, to become the ultimate sacrifice to benefit us. And we would say that words are powerful But his acts, his demonstration, shows us that God is love. And Jesus commanded us to love in the same way. This is what he said. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So how has Jesus loved us? Sacrificially. So how should you love one another? How should we love each other? Sacrificially, unselfishly. So husbands, love your wife. Be sacrificial toward her, even willing to lay down your life for her. Everyone wants to be loved. Raise your hand if you want to be loved. It's everybody. It's a universal truth. Even God wants to be loved. And that's why he created the world. He wants to be loved. And we're made in God's image, so it makes sense that our number one desire is also to be loved. It gives us value, worth, confidence. It gives us a purpose. Studies show that when children don't receive love, it can be detrimental to their development. We want to love and be loved so much that we sing about it. 
John Lennon, all you need is love. And then growing up, and sync, right? I need love was their song. The songs about love are endless, and scripture has so much to say about love. I'm reminded of how I long for the love of my father. When he dropped me off for college in Nebraska, he said, I love you, Matt. Wow, some of the most powerful words ever spoken to me. And we want to know that God, our Heavenly Father, loves us. So how do you know that God loves you? Here are some ways that we know he loves us. He speaks to us through his word. His word is alive. And it's active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It's God's special revelation to us. And when we read it, we get to know him. And he speaks to us through his word. We have a relationship with him that grows as we're in his word. Also, he washes us clean. It's his work in holy baptism. This was last Sunday. Anthony Acosta, son to Mark and Logan Acosta, baptized in Christ. Christ washes us and he cleanses us from unrighteousness. And we know he loves us because he's doing the work. Also, he provides for us. He provides for our daily needs. He provides food for us to eat. He provides spouse and children, air to breathe. He provides all that we need to sustain this body. All that comes from his providential hand. And he even gives us the ability to work. The hands and feet to work is all from him. We know that he directs us with wisdom so that we know right from wrong. He saves us from the traps of Satan so that we can follow his will. We know that God gives us wise direction and he loves us. We also know that he disciplines those he loves. We may not like the discipline, but he disciplines those he loves, Scripture says, so that we'll get on the right path. And he serves us. This is this last week at Urban Youth Ministry in Aurora. Brian, with several of our youth, served children in Aurora. They played games. They had Bible time. They did STEM projects. STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. It was an awesome week of serving. And why do we serve? Because God first served us. Jesus said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So when we serve, we show God's love. He also gives us gifts, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of salvation, the gift of faith. Last week, some members of our church came to my office. They're moving out of state, and they wanted to deliver a gift to me. It was a customized gift to say thank you for being their pastor. It made me feel loved. It made me feel appreciated. When we receive gifts, we know we're loved. So God gives us gifts from heaven. James, the brother of our Lord, said, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father, from the heavenly lights. He also listens to us. How many of you know that when someone truly listens to you, you feel loved? Raise your hand if you know that. When someone's truly listening genuinely, and God listens to your prayers. He listens to what you say. The complaints, the problems, the celebrations, and the praise. And he wants to hear from you because he loves you. And also, he saves us. By far the most important because we couldn't save ourselves. So Jesus, he demonstrated his love for us while we were still sinners. He died for us and saved us from hell, saved us from our sin, saved us from ourselves, and saved us from the jaws of death. God is love. And sometimes we question God's love. So here are two dangers to be aware of, traps that we all fall into. The most common danger is we try to earn God's love, earn God's approval, and it's in our very nature to try to impress and to gain approval of others. I want to gain your approval. 
I want to gain approval from the seminary professor when I'm in seminary. I want to gain approval from my wife. We naturally want to gain approval, right? The problem is our achievements and all that we try to do to earn God's approval, we can never earn his love. His love is based on who he is. God is love. And his love is based on who you are, simply being you. God loves you because you are his creation. And the second danger is we try to enhance God's love. God, I know you love me, but it might not be enough because there's bad things happening to me. Some people fall into this trap. God, if you loved me, you would save me from these things that are happening in my life. Maybe I'm not good enough, or maybe I need to do more to earn more of your love. So we try harder to enhance God's love. And these both are traps. They're both lies of Satan. They're a false gospel called works righteousness. God's love for you is not something you can earn. And it's not something you can enhance. It's given to you fully through God's son, Jesus. The other day, one of our sons called me and asked what he could do to earn some money. He really wanted to buy something, and he was broke. Truth is, we're flat broke and have nothing to offer God to earn his approval. Because we are dead in our transgressions, and dead people don't do anything. So God, in his great love, makes us alive with Christ. He brings us back from the dead. And his love is so big that it went to the cross for our sin to defeat the grave so that we could be with him forever. One of our elders came into my office on Thursday and said, I have one for you, Pastor. God is ineffable. I said, ineffable? I've never heard that word before. He said it means beyond comprehension. You know those two enormous stars I showed you last week? They're light years away. This is how much God loves you. It's ineffable, beyond comprehension, and it's amazing. So we shouldn't try to earn God's love. We shouldn't try to enhance it. So what should we do? We should enjoy God's love. Delight yourself in the Lord. I recently came across a book that intrigued me. The cover and the title, Famous Last Words. Look at this. Fond farewells, deathbed diatribes, and exclamations upon expiration. If you could choose your last words to your loved ones, what would you say? What would I want to tell my family with my last breath? My family was here at the 8.30 service. They're downstairs serving in Sunday school today. And I told them during the first service, these are my last words if I can choose them. Delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. Psalm 37, 4, delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That means to enjoy God's love. Love God and delight in his love for you. And I would also tell them it doesn't mean that life will be easy, but you'll be satisfied in your heart because God is the endless treasure that always satisfies. God is love. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. And think back with me to the gospel reading for today, Christ's parable of the prodigal son. One of the details that's sometimes glossed over is just how great the father's response is. The prodigal son has left his father and squandered everything. He knows he has sinned against heaven and earth. He knows he has nothing to offer his father to earn his approval. 
He knows that his brother will be angry. And he knows that he's flat broke. And he's smelly. And he's ashamed. Why would anyone love him? There's every reason for him not to return home. So the prodigal son admits to himself that he's broke. He has nothing to offer his father. And he rehearses in his head what he's going to say to his father. Father, I have sinned against heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So he comes home with nothing, ready to be rejected. And the father sees him a long way off. And the father's feet start moving running as fast as he can to reach his son. And the father has no time to wait. He slaughters the fattened calf. He begins the celebrations. He puts a royal robe on his lost son, a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, and the father welcomes him home. On what merit? What has the son done to earn favor? Nothing. Undeserved, unexplainable, unearned, uncaused, unconditional. And it's immeasurable, it's ineffable. So, one of the ways that He loves us is He welcomes us back. When we wander astray, God welcomes us back. That's His heart. And that must be the heart of the church. Another way that God loves us is He allows us to leave to walk away. At the beginning, the son wants to leave the family and to squander his inheritance on wild living. And what did the father do? Okay. Now, how could the father do this? The father loves his son and desires genuine love. And so God, our heavenly father, desires genuine love from you and from me. Not robotic or forced love, but true love. God let Adam and Eve eat from the tree and reject him. So God allows people to leave. We learn this about the Israelites who wandered off and worshipped false gods. God allows it because he loves us. Out of his love for us, God gives us the ability to walk away. But God continues to chase after us with his redeeming love. Martin Luther was so compelled by God's love. This is what he said. He must really be a good God. And his love must be a great incomprehensible fire. Much greater than the fire which Moses saw in the burning bush. No, much greater than the fires of hell. And he went on, since this is God's disposition toward the world, who would now despair? This love is so sublime. I cannot do justice to it. I cannot enlarge upon it nor treat it as exhaustively as it really is and truly deserves. As we wrap up today, I want to give you three ways to enjoy God's love for you. I invite you to write these down. These are three things to take home with you. The first one And these are all types of love in the New Testament. The first one is phileo love. That's the Greek word, phileo, and it means a friendship love. God wants you to enjoy a friendship love with your spouse, with your friends, with people at church, to have fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ here. Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Philadelphia, phileo. Think of Ruth and Naomi in the Old Testament. Think of David and Jonathan in the Old Testament. They were friends, so they enjoyed this. And the second one is eros, and this is erotic love. It's a passionate, sensual love between a husband and wife to enjoy together. It's a bond to hold marriage together and faithfulness. And this is from the Lord. The Lord created eros love. And the third one is the love I've been preaching about today, and that's agape love. 
It's unconditional love. It's sacrificial in nature. And it's the most important of all. It's not based on anything you do or anything you've done. You can't earn it or enhance it. So whether you're married or single, this is what God's love is for you. Agape love. And the most famous verse of the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so agape the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. There's a chapter in the Bible called the love chapter and it's 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And when you replace the word love with God, you get a great, great image of who God is. Listen to this. God is patient, God is kind, God does not envy, God does not boast, God is not proud, God is not rude, God is not self-seeking, God is not easily angered, God keeps no record of wrongs, God does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth, God always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, God never fails. Amen? So why do we love? Would you say the underlined part with me? He first loved us. That's why we love. And his love compels us. Would you pray with me? Lord God, thank you so much for the scars of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for demonstrating your love for us with more than words. Lord, while we were far off, you came near to us. And now we love you. We pray for prodigals still to be reached with your love. We pray, Lord, that their heart would be softened, that they would know your love, and that they would see it in us. Help us to obey your commands and to love one another just as you have loved us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand as we sing to the Lord Jesus? love for us how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon a cross my sin upon his shoulders Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in anything No gifts, no power, no wisdom But I will boast in Jesus Christ His death and resurrection why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer 
But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Amen. Please be seated. I'd like to invite forward Gene Walker at this time. Today is Gene's final Sunday as an elder. He has completed his maximum terms of three two-year terms serving us as an elder. So I just want to say a special thanks to Gene uh, for serving. You're going to continue to see him around the church serving in other ways and after service. I invite you to say thanks to him personally and if you would like some personal prayer, he would love to pray with you. Gene? Well, good morning, church. Good morning. I'll still be saying that to you out there. I just wanted to thank our praise team. And it's so neat that they're all members of this church. This isn't a professional group. However, they sound pretty professional to me. And I'm just so grateful to God. And you can hear the love coming from them, can't you, when they're singing? Let's just thank them. So I just wanted to let you know that next Sunday there's going to be a quiz about the three loves and the definitions. So you probably already forgot, didn't you? Were you taking notes? <laughs> well, the interesting part is Pastor tapes this service, and you can go take a look at it <laughs> in your spare time to relook at those loves. But what I wanted to talk about today uh, since Pastor told me I had 15 minutes to talk, because my. <laughs> they always laugh when I say that, Pastor. Uh, but really, I wanted to talk about this love that Pastor's been talking about, and how much I love you guys, and how much our mighty God loves us. And we've got to love Him back. And I just wanted to ask how do you pray? You know, as an elder, we're told to pray the prayers of the church. And that's a pretty big responsibility because I read your prayer cards, all the elders do, and we pray over them. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on here with you people. Man, oh man. And I'm sure a lot of you don't even fill out the card and tell me the truth because I know when I'm at the door and greeting you, Everybody says, how are you? And I say, I'm fine. And they say, they're fine. And then if I was to stop you and go, how are you really? Well, not all that good, you know? So I just want to go to our God in prayer right now. And the way I pray is I just talk to him. Because he loves me so much that I'm his friend. He's my friend. And we can do that because... This Jesus came down and he died for us so that we could do this. So, Lord God, we just come to you right now. We are so grateful for what a mighty God you are, that you came for us when we had no way out. And you died for us. And, Lord, we pray for every person here that if they are not one of your children, if they have not accepted you as their Lord and Savior, that they do it right now, God, because it's so important that we can be within your family, that we can have everlasting salvation. Lord, we just pray that for every person here. And for all the people that are here that are believers, that are members of your kingdom, Lord, let them speak to the others that don't know you. Let them be mighty witnesses for you, Lord, in all that they do. 
because we know that's what we, you require of us. You want us to worship you, and you want us to do your work. And Lord, we are here to tell you that we're willing, that each and every one of us will focus on that. And I'm just speaking for my brothers and sisters here, Lord. I can't make them do it, but I certainly can put it on their minds. So Lord, as we leave here today, let the people out there in the rest of the world that we come in contact with see your love, that we carry it forward, that we see it on the faces, that we hear it in our mouths, and that we let them know the reason for our joy. We love you, God. Amen.